All right. I think it's time to begin. Good morning. Well, that was good. Hey. <laughs> you know, one thing I like about this service, it's casual. Everybody's just coming in and say hello. We need to bring the coffee out in here so people can, you know, have a cup of coffee, warm up. Oh, warm up. Who knew you'd have to warm up today? Right Yesterday was beautiful. Today it's cold again. Who's to say? Who can tell you? Um, I, my, my computer operator seems to be missing. We're, I'm telling you, it's quite the day. <laughs> Scotty to the rescue. Thank you, my man. All right. Let's start with some announcements. I know that we're starting back this week. Uh, tonight, the youth are meeting again at 6 o'clock in the Annex. Snack supper of your have youth or feeling very youthful. <laughs> Join in and uh, with Shannon and the gang. All right. The next one, please, Scotty boy. Thank you. Wednesday night, we start back on our Wednesday night suppers, 5.30. And uh, this Wednesday night is the, uh, uh, the folks from Jappy, the Jamaican, I can't remember the name, the Benjamins, yes. The, um, and uh, they are going to give us a little program, and I think they're going to have some of their banana bread to, to, for sale that they use to, their profits for, for their mission. And... Uh, Ooh, Haitian dinners. From Saturday? This coming sa week from yesterday? Yes. Oh, okay. Ooh. Garage sale and food? Like two of my favorite <laughs> things. Okay. Great. Okay. So tickets for the uh, dinner, the Haitian dinner, mm, will be yummy, and a garage sale next week. All the money is going to go, I'm sure, to, for the Jappy uh, Fund, and they do great work. So please come out Wednesday night and support them, and if you can't come, buy a ticket. If you can come, buy two tickets. There you go. Uh, are there other announcements this week? Any other? Jim, do you know? I had just to the, the youth starting back tonight and the Wednesday night supper, and I couldn't think of any other announcements this week. Do you know? Oh, right. And, um, and it's your house? And what time? I mean, 3 o'clock, I knew that, but what's your address? Can I announce that? 729 Lanier Boulevard. I'll have to get directions from you. I'll be there. Should we bring anything, by the way? Mm -hmm. Oh, hot diggity. Yeah, if you, if you turn off the Bicester Street on Lanier Boulevard by the ballpark right here, it's 0.7 tenths of a mile. <laughs> so we're right on the corner. Our house has a sign out front that says Habersham Park. Oh. And it's a, a brick house with black shutters. And the parking is on the side. There's a road that turns off to the right called Ocean. We're right on the corner of Ocean. And Lanier. All right. Got it. Cool. Uh, oh, thank you. I didn't realize that was Thursday. Trustees, thank you. Trustees tomorrow night. Tuesday night is See, there's so much I was apparently not paying attention. Tomorrow night, trustees. Tuesday night, mission. Thursday night, teenagers are meeting and the church council is meeting. See, so we got a ton of stuff. We jumped back into the new year with, you know, both feet and spurs on, apparently. Great. Anything else? Anybody? Any announcements? Anything you want to share today? All right, as you're willing, as you're able, you stand and join us. Our first song this morning is Come. Now is the time to worship.
Won't you greet each other this morning in the name of Christ? And please sign the friendship pass. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, I thought I turned myself off. Well, thank you. So glad that you're all here. The friendship heads, if you can't find them, they're on the end of the aisle. If somebody needs one here, I'll, I have extras here. So glad you all are here. We're going to take a moment right now to take up our tithes and offerings. this before but I have a little cough so I, I hope you all help me and sing loudly this morning to I'm, I'm, I'm giving it the best I can but I you know <laughs> by all means chime in and speaking of which won't you stand and join us our next song this morning is one thing remains as you stand as you're willing as you're able will you stand
It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you again today with the same prayers that you've heard for a millennium, for millennia. We come to you asking for strength. We ask for peace. We ask for healing. We ask for guidance. We ask for help. And you've heard these things over and over. There's nothing new. But it seems new to us and it seems all important to us. All these things seem so important to us, Lord. And help us clear that away so we know that the one thing that remains, the one thing that is true, the one thing that is eternal is not our problems. It's not our worries. It's not even our blessings. It's you, Lord. It's you. We come to you with this list, but we just need to come to you. Help us learn to stop that sentence and that we just come to you just as we are at every moment help us remember that every moment can be worshipful every moment we can reach out to you every moment we can decide to turn and return to you you are our hope you are our salvation help us turn to you Lord help us in Jesus name we pray
For us, as well as faith works, we have such a great team uh, getting everything together. Um, Celia and Monica got volunteers down there to clean the room out. The sheriff's department brought us in. Yeah, we know what we need. We can build the house that we need, and it's great, great. I think it's great. Uh, and we're going to Sun. So, well, here's the sun coming up, and saw uh, saw a little bit way back in the way back in the west of it. Saw a little line of red. So I think we're probably supposed to have a little rain tomorrow. But here's the sun coming up, and it's beautiful on the marshes. And a blue heron is just coasting along. Now he's right beside me as we're going across the causeway, and you know the causeway speed limit is 45, so that's what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> But he's cru cruising along, and then I'm going down 341. There's a squirrel running across a high wire, and he stops and looks at the sun, too, you know. I mean, it was just so impressive. It was impressive. And that song comes to my heart, and I know you've heard me say this before, and I can't help but repeat it because, see, this is all about hope. This is all about hope in apocalyptic times. Some people are looking for doom, and it's almost like they're not going to be happy unless it happens. attitude that thinks the apocalypse is just around the corner. I, I really believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be taken out before any kind of apocalypse happens. But here's the thing. And, and I love this hymn. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. That was a, that was a song that was a triggering moment for my daddy, uh, bringing him out of four months of depression. 
uh, when he after he'd gotten out of the Navy, had a good job, had a home, had two little boys and uh, a loving wife, and God called him into the ministry. And after four months of deep, deep, dark depression, he, he the words to that hymn came to him on a bright, beautiful sunrise. So this morning, I want to look at this hope. And again, I'm referring to the book of Romans, because if anybody needed to know, if anybody thought they were in the apocalypse, it was people who lived in Roman times, because the Roman Empire was beginning to crumble. Uh, the support of the government for the popular people was beginning to fail. There were some terrible things going on. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's this cult movement, what people think is a cult movement, movement throughout. Was this an indicator that something else was going to happen to Rome? Uh, this encounter with Christ that people were having from Caesar's household to the worst, the, you know, the worst conditions possible, the slave uh, areas of, of the city of Rome. So in Romans 15, verses 11, 12, and 13, hear these words. And again, now he's building the case for the idea of the glory of God. He says, and again... Uh, uh, and he's talking about, and I have to give you maybe a little, little bit of a paradigm. He said, uh, I say to you that Jesus Christ has become a servant of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. In other words, these are the things that are given to confirm the promises. We live on the hope of the promises that God has given us. So here, picking it up at verse 11, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. That's us. You see, that's us. This, Paul, Paul is a Jew dealing with Jews. But now, you see, encounters with Christ are bringing about believers who don't have this connection of 2,500 years with the Hebrew faith. Uh, we're, we're the outside looking in, see? And he says, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there should be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. That's us again. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll stop there because in our day and time, then may God add the blessing of understanding to the reading of his word. But in our time, what people have is a lack of hope. You see, he says the, the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in your believing that you may abound in hope. He wants us to abound in this hope. This is what is to make up our lives. And that's why I want to call this the, the, uh, the pursuit of hope. Now, you know, some people only think that hope is going to be restored when the economy is restored. Or when something happens significant with Obamacare, good or bad. And I don't know. And I want to stay out of the discussion. I, I, I worry about it. But nevertheless, that's not where my hope is. OK, uh, I love there's a story that comes out of Auschwitz in World War Two. Uh, Rabbi Hugo Grin uh, is well up in years now, but he was a small child when he was in a camp and one of the worst death camps. But on Hanukkah, the first day of Hanukkah, Hanukkah, he took the pat of butter that was all the food that the family had then at that time. No hope for much else, uh, if anything else. They didn't know. Just lived from day to day. But uh, at this time, it was early. Uh, there were still families that could be together in Auschwitz. And he took the only pat of butter that was the significance, of, that was the significant remains of any food that they had hope of for the next couple of days. And he took a piece of string from the rags that he was wearing and he put it in that pat of butter and he lit it. And one of his little kids said to him, said, Daddy, that's all the food we've got left. And he said, this is Hanukkah. We light, this is the Feast of Lights. Now, Hanukkah, whether or not you're familiar with that, uh, that, was, uh, that was a festival that was established whenever the Maccabean revolt against Rome had happened, 132 to 135 AD, uh, BC. And uh, Hanukkah was a Feast of Lights when the restoration of the temple occurred during that time. And Hanukkah today is the Feast of Lights, a nine-candle menorah. One is the attendant. There were eight days of Hanukkah. I don't know if, you, if you've ever studied the significance of that, but one candle was the attendant candle. You light that regardless of the others that are lit. But each day you add a candle. It's kind of like our Advent wreath. And, uh, or you can just light one candle a day, and that, that can be Hanukkah too. But the father said to the son, he said, uh, we cannot give up hope. He said, this 
he said, without faith, we have no hope. And he said, we can't give up our hope. I, that was significant to me. Um, in 1989, there was an 8.2 uh, earthquake on the Richter scale. Some of you will remember that almost flattened Armenia. And I remember the story of a father who raced to the school to get his son who was buried under the trash. Now, not all the very, very tragic stories. Uh, over 30,000 people died in four minutes' time when that happened. But this father raced to the school that had collapsed, and when he approached it, all he saw was the ruin of the school just heaped on itself. Just no chance that anybody was alive. But he began to dig two, four, six, eight hours. The police came to get him, said, look, you just have to get out, leave it to us. We'll we'll clear this out later. He said, I've got to find out. I've got to know for sure. And he kept digging 12, 24, 36 hours, nonstop. He just dug and dug and finally got down low enough. And he kept calling his son's name. And then he heard his son answer from deep in the rubble. And this is what he said. He said, Daddy, I told the kids, I told my friends you would come. I told my friends you would come. Now, that's hope. That's not giving up hope in spite of what's happening. Now, the first point for this hope in apocalyptic times is simply this. He is the source of hope. He is the source of hope. Now, we, underst we need to understand um, this thing about source. Because if we, if we get the source wrong, then we wonder why the supply fails. If we don't go to the source, you know that people will often tell you, you hear a rumor? Go to the source. Go to the source. You know, if you can find the source, go to the source, get the truth of it, find out exactly what it means. Now, when Jesus talked about sources, and he did several times, when Jesus talked about sources, he, he mentioned this thing about fresh water and salt water. And I was talking to somebody who here in our church is a member of our church who fishes regularly and he said with all of this rain there's too much fresh water for the saltwater trout to come you know far up the tributaries because the salinity in the water changes and they can't live can't live in it with so much fresh water now jesus had this same comparison of fresh with salt when he said can the same source produce both and it can't you see it's either fresh water coming up from a fresh water source or salt water from a salt water source and there's no you know there's no crossover You've got, to, you've got to look and consider the source. Now, understanding that Christ is the source of our hope, when we understand that he is the one that our hope comes from, then here's, here are some of the results. Uh, and I've got four things that I want to lift up to you under this point with him being the source of our hope. Your source determines, first of all, your fruit. Now, this is not a conclusive list. Uh, and, and you might think of think of other things, but I think these are things that are important for us to do, to talk about in these day and times and in on the beginning of a new year. Your source determines your fruit. Now, how many of you know that you can change the color of a hydrangea plant? You know you, you can do, okay, everybody in here is a gardener. So. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know this until I read a story one time about a murder weapon that was hidden in the ground beneath a hydrangea. And this smart detective, see, this smart detective who knows about gardening realizes this hydrangea has changed color from one year to the next, from blue to pink or pink to blue. I forget what it is, you know, but you can put rusty metal underneath, you know, and it's the iron, the oxide, I don't know. You all tell me you know the difference between uh, the two, but it changes the color of a hydrangea because of where it's drawing its source. You get either pink or blue. And I, I thought that was fascinating. Now, put that in the spiritual context as we face difficult times. Your source determines your fruit. What are you producing? What are you producing for the kingdom of God? What are you producing in your life? What kind of fruit are you bearing? And I'm not talking about starting a 501c3. You know, I'm not talking about everybody going out and beginning a nonprofit uh, charitable organization. I'm talking about the fruit. Now, earlier on in this chapter, in the 15th chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, bearing burdens and the burdens of the weak that we give up pleasing ourselves in order to bear the burdens of the weak, just as Christ 
forgave his own pleasures to bear our burdens and to take upon him what was necessary for the cross. And he says, in so doing, God is going to bless. And he says, uh, for whatever things were written before, written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, this is the scripture. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, who reproached you fell on me. Now, the point is, what kind of fruit? Lifting up one another's burdens, doing good things, doing good things for those who hurt. Second thing under this is your source determines your giving. Wow. I mean, there's a spiritual principle placed right on the table, you know? Your source determines your giving. What do you consider to be your source? You see, I, I tell you that there's a difference in the way that a man or a woman gives with regard to how they look at the source of what they receive. You know, where does your check come from? Well, it comes from the school board. It comes from the government. It comes from a private contractor. It comes from, you know, retail establishment. I don't, I don't know. Well, you know, it's God who gives you health. You know, it's God who gives you wisdom. It's God who gives you the ability to do what you do. What is the source? What is the source? And I tell you, I, I believe with all of my heart, it determines our giving. Your source determines your giving, your understanding of your source. Your source determines your joy. You know, when I see people who have a lack of joy in their lives, I, I, I immediately go to the, to the spiritual side of thinking through emotional issues connected with joy. Where does joy come from? What did, what did we just read that he wants us to have this joy? Um, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You see, when you believe in him, then he who is the source is going to give you joy and peace. You don't have to de determine, you don't have to depend upon it from external circumstances. It doesn't have to come from somebody else. It doesn't have to come from our kids doing the right things. It doesn't have to come from our family living the way that they should. It doesn't have to come from somebody else. It comes from the one who is the source. He is the source of hope. That's the main point of, the point of this section. The fourth thing under this is your source determines your hope then. Okay? Very simply. Now, then to finish up this idea of source, when Jesus finished up his talking about the sources, he said, out of the heart. Out of the heart. Then James picks it up later on and he says, out of the mouth. Can the same mouth curse God? Can the same mouth express hope? Can the same mouth express faith and trust in Christ? And out of that same mouth, because you see, it's not the mouth that's the, vic that's the guilty party. It's the heart. It's the source of the individual. Now, second point under hope for apocalyptic times is, first of all, he's the source, but secondly, he's the supplier. Now, there's a difference between the source and the supplier. If you don't believe that, look at the coca leaf in Colombia. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a leaf that grows on a plant that for centuries, people in that part of the world would take it and chew on it. Now, I cannot make a value judgment because I'm a coffee addict. I drink coffee 24 hours a day. You know, does it do anything for me? At this point, it really doesn't. It doesn't keep me up at all. I will tell you this. Somebody told me, said, Preacher, I'll bet you can't stop drinking coffee for a week. I said, I can. I can. And I stopped on a Sunday night and went that entire week. Now, I will tell you that what they tell you about those little caffeine things in your brain, I had a fierce headache. <laughs> I had a fierce headache for two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. That's just, I guess that's a side effect of it. And then after that Sunday night, no big deal, and I picked it back up again. So it really doesn't do anything for me. At least that's what I say. You know, doctor might say something different. But here's the thing. I, I don't know whether they're just chewing on a coca leaf. They say it gives them a little something. I don't know. I don't know if it did or not. But there's somebody so devious, and it comes from the heart of Satan, who figure out how you can put all those things in a big pot and cook it down and and dry it out and do all these things and it becomes a white powder and you can cook it into rocks of crack and it's a plague it's a plague but you see the source is down there in Colombia there's got to be a supplier that gets it up here and you see just as soon as we figure out one way that suppliers are being caught then they figure out another way to get it here nobody has 
load or stop the supply of cocaine to this country, no matter how many busts are made. You know, they've even tried submarines. They caught a little, <laughs> little port down in South America a couple years ago where they had these South Americans building a submarine to try to get cocaine into this country. Now, there's a difference between the source and the supplier. Paul says, again, to the letter in the Philippians, my God shall what? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you know who the unsung heroes are in our massive military machine that we have? When, when we're successful around the world, when America takes up our arms against an enemy, do you know who the unsung heroes are? It's the quartermaster department. It's the people that feed the military. Alexander the Great is credited with first saying something that General Eisenhower repeated, and everybody thought he said it first, but he didn't, and that is that an army marches on its stomach. Do you know? You have to have the supply. And somebody's got to think through all that process. Somebody's got to line up all the MREs. Now, frankly, I've had some MREs. I, I don't know. I hear people complain about it. You know, we lived at Fort Stewart over in Columbus for six years, and I heard the military complain about those things. I've, I've been to Haiti, and I've been to the Congo, and I don't complain about food. I determined. I ha I'm glad I had those experiences when I was young. Now, there may be things that I don't prefer as far as eating. That list is very small, I can tell you, but I do not complain about food. And that, to me, there wasn't anything wrong with MREs. But you, you understand what we're, what we're trying to get to here. And in verse 12, uh, he says, um, well, that you bound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that, it, this, he, that he is the supplier. Then moving into part, uh, point three, he's the strength of our hope. He's the source. He's the supply. And I hope that you remember that illustration that I've used about the olive uh, I mean, the, uh, the grapevine, because a grapevine, you see them all over the Middle East. In fact, some of the great big grapevines that come out of the ground could be huge like this. Ages and ages old, these vines that still bear fruit. But a grapevine's not good for anything except one thing, and that is providing the nourishment from the ground to the grapes. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He is our supplier. Now, third point, he's the strength of our hope. Now, Job ran up against this when he's struggling in chapter 6 of the book of Job. In 6, verses 11 through 13, we won't, we won't take time to read it. He said, what strength do I have left in me that I should hope? Now, what was, what's wrong with that statement? What strength do I have in me that I should have any hope whatsoever? Well, you see, he's depending upon his own strength. The same trap that we fall into whenever we fall into suffering or difficulty in our lives. We say, there's no more strength in me. I don't have any more hope. Well, you see, it's coming from the wrong source then. It is coming from the wrong source. Now, listen, here's what, here's what David, here's what David wrote. Now, I want to read this to you because I think it's, it's that significant. There's a song written to these words. I know that you've read them before, but hear it, hear it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. Not his own strength not my own strength, one thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of God all my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, listen, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Now, another passage that I want to read to you that the apostle wrote to the Corinthians in urging them to understand that God is the, is the strength of their hope. Not only is he their source, and not only is he the supplier, but he is the strength of hope. And it comes from 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 9 and 10. Listen to this. 
Now, here's the apostle. He, he's giving you a little insight into his own suffering. See, we hear about all these wonderful things. Here is a man, y'all, who could reach down and take a little slave girl and raise her up from the dead. God gave him that ability, gave, gave him that power in that moment. Here is a man who, could, who saw people healed instantaneously. Here is a man who could speak and people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this, is, this was a vessel. This was a vessel used by God. But listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 8 concerning this thing. Now, he doesn't tell us what it is. It doesn't tell us. Concerning this thing I pleaded. Now, listen, if anybody had prayers of efficacy before the throne of heaven, it was the apostle Paul. This was a man who saw dead brought back to life. This was a man who saw Jesus face to face. If there's anybody who can talk face to face with God about what he's going through, it's Paul. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I can't read this without feeling it. He said to me, and this is written in red letters. These are the words of Christ. My strength, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect. In weakness. And then the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's the strength of our hope. I want to close this morning by reading the words to a song that I'm going to mention to Cameron. We're going to do this song. He and I and maybe one or two others. It's called There is a River. Every now and then the Lord will bring this song to me and it just blesses my heart. There came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. It filled their hearts with singing and gave them peace within. The prophet gave this promise, the spirit will descend. And from your inner, be from your inner being, a river with no end. There is a river that flows from deep within. There's a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to this water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. There was a thirsty woman who was drawing from a well. Her life was ruined and wasted. Her soul was bound for hell. Then she met the master who told of her great sin and said, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. There is a river that flows from God above. There is a fountain that's filled with his great love. Come to this water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. How many of you ever heard of go, go, <laughs> Gaither Vocal Band? Have you ever heard Gaither Vocal Band sing it? Or Jimmy Swagger? Jimmy Swagger did a version of that. It's just incredible. It brings tears to your eyes. He's the source. He's the supplier. And he's our strength. Y'all come close for us. As you're willing, as you're able, will you stand and join us? Our closing song this morning is Remind Me Who I Am.
thank you that we can belong to you and that you are the source, the supplier, and the strength of our hope for this new year. Lord, we hope for better things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed.